Okay, thank you for everyone for tuning in. My name is Isaac. Before we get started, I just want to point your attention to our virtual schedule that is currently posted on the Jersey City Free Public Library Facebook page. It is there where you can find out about more author talks like tonight, more entertainment, conversations, and lectures that's happening throughout the day and throughout the week. Tonight, we're going to be having Marcus J. Moore speak about his new book. Marcus Moore is an award-winning music journalist, editor, curator, pundit, and author. Mr. Moore is a contributing writer with The Nation and a contributing editor with Bandcamp Daily. His coverage of soul, jazz, hip hop, and rock can be found at the New York Times, Pitchfork, Entertainment Weekly, The Washington Post, NPR, Rolling Stone, and The Atlantic, among many other outlets. Thank you for being with us and welcome. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate your time. Rap and hip hop music has become a globalized music genre with deeply rooted elements in African music and history. The tumultuous 1970s gave birth to rap music in the 1970s with pioneers like DJ Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flesh, Curtis Blow, Cindy Campbell, MC Light, Queen Latifah, and many more. These trailblazers laid the foundation for our conversation. Today, we will look at Mr. Moore's new book, The Butterfly Effect, How Kendrick Lamar Ignited the Soul of Black America. So my first question to you, Mr. Moore, is that uh, The Butterfly Effect is a thoughtfully written book of Kendrick Lamar's life. The details and storyline you provide in this book are remarkable. Can you explain the title and how did you come to write this piece? Yeah, uh, you know, admittedly, I'm I'm gonna confess. Like, I didn't, I honestly didn't realize the double meaning of the butterfly effect until after uh, the deal got locked in. You know, I just thought because when I was listening to to Pimp a Butterfly, even before I started writing the proposal, I just was really enamored by the album. You know, I was like, man, it's a great record. I wonder how. Thundercat came into the room. I wonder how Robert Glasper got in here and Anna Wise and all these great people. And at first I was going to write a full book. I wanted to write a full book on To Think of Butterfly. You know, I was like, I could just write 300 words on that. Uh, excuse me, 300 pages on that. Um, so, you know, so that's where the title came from. But it wasn't until I sat down and realized when I was writing the book they're like, oh, this is a book about how Kendrick became Kendrick, about how he sort of morphed into this, you know, Kendrick Lamar in all caps, like this major rap star. And so that's when I realized the duality in it, and, you know, just sort of just hit me uh, on the back end. Um, but I came to, to write the book. Honestly, the idea came during a lunch break. Uh, it was like 2017. And... Um, I was uh, working in Greenpoint at the time as a uh, band came daily, the senior editor. And like I was just saying, I was listening to the album to, to Pepper Butterfly and I was just so enamored by it because I'm such a jazz head that I was just like, man, I, I really think there's a book in this. And um, so I ran it past two very smart people, two authors who have been around this block a bunch of times. And they were like, yeah, that's a great idea. You ought to go with it, don't wait. We need to be celebrating black art when it's happening. And I totally agree with that. And um, so long story short, I um, I had a meeting with a potential agent, this guy named William Loturco. And before we could even sit down with our coffee, he was like, yes, let's do it. And uh, it took me like two months. It took me like two months to write a proposal. And we got it locked in by late March, 2018. And then from there, it was full speed. It was uh, writing a thousand words a day. It was, um, you know, listening to his music over and Kendrick's music over and over again to write a full narrative. And those were the beginnings of it. Um, just, you know, I had the idea. I thought it was a crazy idea because it was history that was still happening, but I decided to just be fearless and go for it. You said you wrote a thousand words a day to get the project mm -hmm. done, right? So how did you like piece it together? Like how, you got these chapters very strategically organized. Um, how did you know what to start with, what to what to leave out, what to add? Um, did you like diagram it? Because it's, 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 it's a good piece of work and I'm just um, 
you know, really impressed on how, because it, it reads like a, a biography, it is a biography, um, and you're not a historian, so how were you able to like glue this together so beautifully? You know, man, honestly, I treated it, I treated it like a big old article, if I'm being, if I'm being real, because I come from that, that, that realm of like, you know, writing this big features and writing where you had to bring so many different voices into this one pot and make it all sing, make it resonate. Mm -hmm. Like even before I had been uh, covering music, uh, I covered education in Prince George's County. I covered politics and unit. So I've always been right. I've always written these stories where I had to bring in all these different voices and make it make sense on deadline. Mm -hmm. And so what I did with this, it was the same thing. You know, it was my first book. So even saying the word book sort of freaked me out for a while. Like, man, no, this is nope. This ain't a book. It's a, it's an article, man. That's how I got to treat it. So that's how I did it. That's how I did it. I, um, and I didn't, I didn't really map it out. The only thing that I mapped out honestly was just the book proposal. Like I, I kept the book proposal beside me to make sure that I was staying on track, but I also deviated because I realized the context was key in this regard because I knew what I was up against. I knew that it's the first book on Kendrick Lamar ever. I'm an East Coast dude writing about West Coast hip hop. And at the same, at the time I was writing the book, I was living, I still live, I still split time between Brooklyn and Nairobi, Kenya in East Africa. So, you know, I knew I, there was a lot going on there. So I needed to make sure it was airtight. And so, to answer your question, man, I just literally, the reason why the book has a meditative tone is because I wanted to make sure that every T was crossed, every I was dotted. And so if I'm writing about Compton, oh, let me reach out to Alonzo Williams and have him talking about Compton. If I'm writing about him in school, I need to talk to Reggie Inge. So I honestly treated it like an article, like I would sit down and I would write. And then when I would come to a point where you know, I'm talking about police brutality in Los Angeles. I'm like, well, what, this isn't the first time. Let's talk about what happened in the 60s. Let's talk about what happened in the 70s and 80s. Because I also realized that not only is it a biography, I also wanted it to be a piece of history. I wanted it to be where future generations can look back and, and get a snapshot of what happened not only in 2015, 2016, but in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s as well. So that's how I mapped it out, man. So, you know, it's padded with a lot of context on purpose because I knew that, you know, not only was it about Kendrick, I, I wanted to sort of frame how he became and, and, and all these different elements that sort of aided his progression. I wanted it all in the book at the same time. My next question is dealing with chapter one. You titled it, How He Got Robbed. Um, you discussed the controversy between Kendrick Lamar and the rapper Macklemore. You write, hip hop was black music and for Macklemore to release such a song felt like a slight to the art form and to the minorities from whom Kendrick Lamar spoke. Is it your contention that Macklemore appropriated not just a genre but black culture itself using its music to peddle safe messages to a mostly white audience? Can you speak about the controversy and why cultural appropriation within rap and hip hop culture is commonplace in this music genre. Yeah, I feel like um, there's still a segment of the population who doesn't believe, they don't believe that hip hop is actual music. They, they still see it as a fad for whatever reason. There's still this, you know, I remember when hip hop was coming of age in the early to mid eighties, where that was, those were all the stories. All the stories were, oh, this is a passing thing. It's not going to be around for a while. And a lot of those people who felt like hip hop was just a fad in 86 and 87 have grown older to sort of run culture and be in these, in these um, executive suites. And they still have the same ideas about hip hop. They still feel like it's just a bunch of black people, you know, just sort of talking. They don't see the artistry in putting poetry to all of these very complex samples and beats and, you know, even down to the DJing, like you're piecing together this puzzle of old soul and jazz and making it something totally new. So, you know, I, I feel like I couldn't totally 
fault Macklemore because I have to give him credit in this regard that at least he had songs here and there when I listened to his older stuff. He had songs where he was trying, you know, like he acknowledged, like, hey, I'm a white guy in this black industry. I, I want to be down for the cause, but at the same time, I just got to, I got to talk about what's true to me. So he always came off very conflicted to me. But that doesn't excuse the whole, you know, the reason why the, the book, the first chapter is called How You Got Robbed is because it was about that text message that he sent where he won best new rap album or best rap album. But it wasn't enough just to text Kendrick and say, oh, you know, I robbed you or whatever. It's just, it sucks that I robbed you. He had to let the world know. So the issue that I've always had with Macklemore is that he'll have songs where he's talking about, you know, he's talking about real issues and he's talking about white privilege, but he also has these other songs where he's clearly trying to pander to a, a majority white audience where he's almost making a mockery of the culture that he's a part of. And that's how I felt with Thrift Shop and, and Can't what, can't, slow, can't Stop Me Now, you know, like those songs, I had issues with those because it didn't seem like his best stuff. Whereas even music before that, you could tell that he, you know, there was some, there was something behind it. There was some lyrical dexterity behind it, but the stuff that blew him up and, and got him the victory over Kendrick is not, it, it was corny, you know, for the lack of a better term. Um, and so at the time, everybody thought that Macklemore's music was way more palatable and he was the bigger star, but we've seen how that's played out. You know, Kendrick didn't win, but he's the ultimate winner in the end. Like even today on Pitchfork, there was a piece that went up that was like, oh, waiting for Kendrick. It's like, now he's a mythical figure, whereas Macklemore is still making music, but he do, he's not held in the same regard that he was seven years ago. And so, you know, his cultural appropriation, I think, was problematic because it was on a huge, huge stage. And I think it speaks more to the struggles with the system overall. And I even said it in the book, they just don't reward the albums that they need to be rewarding. And he was a recipient of a reward that even he admits that he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have gotten. He didn't deserve it. So do you blame the system in terms of how um, artists are selected who is behind the decision making? Um, do you, what's your sort of response to that? Uh, because it seems like this can happen again, where clearly you, you you have a winner here, but because of different metrics that play a part in deciding um, what artist gets it and what artist doesn't get it. Yeah, I feel like it is it's it's a major problem with the system overall, and I feel like they the academy is just going to choose names that they're familiar with. So. Mm -hmm. I also understand that I'm a person, I'm always going to be a crate digger. I'm always going to be the dude that says like, okay, all those records are cool, but what about these obscure records over here, these records that are just beneath the mainstream that folks ought to be listening to. But I feel like that's the stuff and they don't really listen to stuff like that. And even in the case of like Macklemore versus Kendrick, anybody who listened to those records I don't know anybody who listened to his records and thought that Macklemore's album is truly better than Good Kid, Mad City. Like, and anybody who says that, I'm looking at them sideways because it just doesn't make any sense. And it's the same thing, you know. It's been it's been a history over and over again. And um, so, like in 1984, you know, people recognized um, Lionel Richie's album "Can't Slow Down" to be better than like "Purple Rain," you know. And this is like, wait, like I don't. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, obviously it's black artists to black artists, but the, they don't reward the music that's actually good or better. And they don't come around, they come around to the artist. So they'll come around to somebody, even when they come out with a record that, that in my opinion, shouldn't have won an award, that's the one that'll get an album of the year. Or that's the one that'll get, you know, some of the other awards, R&B album of the year or rap album, yada, yada. Um, but it's it's a problem not even just with the grant with the recording academy. It's also in the um, the movie academy. It's across the board where it's still run by older white people who are going to vote majority white every time, and they're not going to reward esoteric black art. And that's that's what Kendrick was doing at the time. You know, if you think back to hip hop, then it wasn't that long ago. 
but it was very celebratory. You know, everybody was in the club. We were all celebrating. The music was glossy. And here comes Kendrick with this album that's clearly West Coast, but it sounds like an old Outkast album. It has uh, some good mob elements. It has all this stuff. And it was just too much. It was too much for people, and they didn't understand it. And so what I think needs to, what needs to be done moving forward, you need to have better people in the room who are not only going to listen to mainstream records, but they're also going to listen to underground records. They're going to listen to the best music of the year and make a strong determination as to what should be the winner and not just rewarding something because we know the name. My next question is coming from uh, the chapter on California love. You talk about the West Coast and its impact on Black culture. Can you talk more about why you chose to focus on the history of rap culture on the West Coast um, in writing this book? I mean, it's clear that he's from the West Coast, but um, is there any other reasons why you uh, chose to explore that? Yeah, you know, I, I guess more of a, I mean, obviously, like you said, he's from LA, and so it's the natural. Mm -hmm. he, he's a guy from LA, so you have to talk about the history he came from. Mm -hmm. But on a personal note, um, my when I was growing up in the DC area, my cousin, my cousins um, Isaac and Eric were really into West Coast hip hop. I mean, like you, my my cousin Ike, you would have thought he was from Compton. He had the the low shades and all this stuff, but he's clearly in Landover, Maryland, right? So <laughs> he had all of that. But so I grew up with West Coast hip hop, uh, mm -hmm. even in DC, in the DC area. Uh, but the reason why I focus so heavily on West Coast hip hop is because when you listen to Kendrick, it's, it's easy to tell that he does everything for Compton. You know, he does everything for the West Coast where he loves his hometown. He loves his neighborhood. He loves the people around it. And so even going back to the title, the butterfly effect, you, you have to, I wanted to humanize him as much as possible. And so I, there was no denying that. You know, he's born in 1987, just as gangster rap was becoming what it became, or what, you know, just as NWA was coming out, just as IC was coming out, and they were doing their thing. And he comes from all that. He's like, he's from the school of Eazy E and from like Dr. Dre and Ice Cube and all that. And so, again, the context was important because, you know, a lot of, a lot of people would have just said like, oh, Kendrick's the greatest and that's it. And the whole book would have just been that. But I wanted to walk through, I wanted to calmly walk through how he became who he became. And he's such a West Coast guy that you have to steep yourself in all facets of the West Coast, not just, not just rap, but also the riots and also um, the police brutality, you know, all of that stuff that makes its way into his music now, it comes from somewhere else. And, and what I also wanted to do indirectly was, you know, add context because a lot of music writing these days, you know, it, it's, it's sort of seeped into here and now. So it's, okay, we're writing about a record that we think is great right now, but a lot of times writers fail to realize that, well, hey, it's derivative of this other thing. It's derivative of IT, it's derivative of NWA and all of that. And so I wanted to do that because I also knew that this book was going to be on shelves and it was going to be, you know, thrift shops like forever and forever. So um, I, I couldn't give short shrift to the history while talking about somebody like Kendrick. You also uh, mentioned like the difference in terms of rap culture within the West Coast. And it really took, I'm originally from the West Coast, Sacramento. So the music that we listened to up north was more, it, it wasn't Southern California music. It was all hyphy movement, you know, one year older than Kendrick. And so the time that he's, you know, you know, starting to rise, the hyphy movement is already sort of prominent in Northern California. And uh, so a lot of nor nor Northern Californians are just, you know, focused on that. And you spoke a little bit about how that was kind of getting some traction at the same time he was trying to get traction. And so it was kind of like over, you know, powering him in a way in the sense that he's not getting that sort of like recognition, you know, I suppose in terms of the, 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 the quality of work because he's competing with so many different forces. So can you talk about how you were able to draw those conclusions? Um, so good, because uh, that's, that's true. I mean, you know, back in the early 2000s, 
we were not bumping Kendrick Lamar like that. <laughs> you know, we were all, you know, right. listening to E-40 and all other rappers that came, you know, and that was, you know, popular. So uh, how did you figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I remember it. I mean, because even before I was covering music, I've always been a music nerd and I've always been around like DJs and, and all kinds of people. But I also remember, uh, you know, like every every so often there's always, oh, such and such is the new king of West Coast rap, you know? So it was, you know, it was dormant for a while because like NWA, like NWA was done. Dr. Dre was, had his own label. Ice Cube was off doing something. Snoop was doing something else. And so it was like this, this deserted, you know, sort of wasteland for the lack of a better term. And then here comes the game. Oh, the game is the new king of West Coast rap. So I just remembered, honestly, I remembered that, you know, okay, people wouldn't really bump in uh, LA rap like that, you know? And I also backed it up with research. So I didn't want to just say it and then that just be it. I also backed it up with, okay, am I crazy? I, I don't remember there being like a king of West Coast rap in like the mid 2000s or whatever. Um, it was all hyphy movement. Like you said, it was all like, the music was louder and it was because of Lil John and stuff mm -hmm. like that, where everything was loud, everything was a party and all of that. So, was different, you know, yeah, I, I want to, yeah, I was thinking as you're talking, because LA has a more, like you said in the book, I was like, he, he, he knows what he's talking about. LA has a very, you know, more, the tempo is lower in terms of, you know, the beat, you know, it's not like a high tempo, energetic, you know, make you jump off the wall type of music. And LA is kind of like, you know, you chilling, you know, you just listen to the music, lay back. And so, you know, you were comparing and contrasting that um, and how Kendra kind of like did something different. He didn't follow that, you know, uh, sort of traditional path of, oh, that's an LA beat right there. Or that's, you know, LA music. So uh, can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Like, I, I, the thing that I like, I've always liked about Kendrick is that he, he, you can tell that he's a, he's a weird kid, man, like, in a good way, mm -hmm. in a good way, where, like, um, yeah, he's totally an LA dude, but he likes, he likes Outkast. He likes mm -hmm. stuff that's not LA. And that's the thing, like, people, there's always this perception that you have to just love where you're, love the music of where you're from, and that's it. You got to ride for, if you're an artist, you have to create the kind of music that's from your region and that is all but that's not the case with him like you could tell that he listened to his mom's old um soul records he was listening to jazz he was listening to cast and dungeon family and all of that and so the thing that i think makes kendrick stand out is because he was the first dude i think ever probably or at least since like dre you know since they were sampling um like funkadelic and all of that but he was the first dude in several years to draw from so many different forces and not just mainstream forces. He was sampling the foreign exchange. He had like, um, he sampled a root song. You know, he was sampling so many different things that folks weren't really listening to. And uh, I even said it madly, it told me in chapter one and he said it so succinctly. He was just like, he, he had soul and a lot of LA dudes don't have the soul that he had. And so that's what sort of made him stand out. And so, I think that's what makes Kendrick stand out more than anything now. It's like, he's not afraid of different sounds. He's not afraid to, he loves LA, but he's not afraid to venture outside of LA to get his sound. I want to talk about um, the trauma that you write about that um, Kendrick experienced. Um, you, there's a part in the book um, where, you know, growing up, he's seen, you know, people get shot dead right in front of him. And then a, a close friend of his, um, when readers and people who are interested in uh, reading this book, what did you want them to learn from the uh, trauma that uh, Kendrick experienced? Um, what was the point of uh, mentioning that? I mean, it's shocking and it's unfortunate, but there's a lot of trauma that uh, Kendrick experienced. So what was your sort of uh, point of uh, mentioning that in the text? Uh, honestly, just, I wanted to, well, a couple of reasons, mainly though, I wanted to tell the whole story. Um, I didn't want to just, I mean, a lot of the book is fan letter. It's me saying like, oh, this dude is great. And here's why it's great. But I also don't want to shy away from mental health challenges that us as black 
men and as black people go through that people don't want to hear about. You know, people don't want to people don't want to hear about some of the trauma that you just sort of ingest just being a black person in America. You know, just sort of the tightness that you walk around with because you don't know what's around this corner. You don't know what's going to happen to you. And the fact that, like you just pointed out so astutely, he went through some really, really crazy drama where he's seen people get shot. He, you know, he couldn't wear the wrong color hat or that might be a problem. It's just all of this stuff. He's seeing relatives going in and out of jail. It's important to talk about that stuff because it's stuff that a lot of us deal with. Maybe not maybe not on the same dramatic scale, but we all have somebody that's been in and out of jail maybe, or you, you've seen something happen that you, you just, you can't talk about and maybe you want to take it to your grave or whatever. But he's so open and honest about it in his music. And I think that's pretty noble because a lot of like other artists wouldn't, wouldn't be as raw as he would be. And I think that's what makes him stand out ultimately is that, um, you know, other people, may reference it they may sort of kind of talk about it but he's like going into very very deep detail about like man my, my younger sister got pregnant and i wasn't there for her. i got the survivor's guilt i'm on the road i'm thinking about suicide all of that man so i think um more than anything else man i, I wanted to point that out because he is showing people that it's okay to talk about traumatic events and not be looked and not be seen as lesser than and not be seen as uh soft you know for the lack of a better term um and so I, I think that's pretty cool that he's that he's talking about those sorts of things but i also think that it's great that he's so open about it and that's why he doesn't do interviews you know that's why he doesn't say a whole lot now is because he says it all in music and that's why i wanted to unpack everything so if there's anybody else out there who may be going through the same stuff it'll embolden, it'll, it'll sort of encourage you to discuss whatever it is, maybe seek therapy or write it in a journal. Um, Cause that's essentially what he did. He was just writing it in the journal for everybody to hear. And um, yes, yeah, so I wanted to celebrate that because I don't think we do that enough. Uh, the next question I wanna ask you is about the style of rapping he um, does and his music. It's very different and very unique. There's not, there's not any rappers that rap like him. And so can you, he's been compared to uh, uh, prolific rappers like Nas and Jay-Z. And there's even a, a, a parallel that you make between Nas and, um, and Kendrick with the album covers, Illmatic and um, Kid Mad City. So could you talk a little bit about his rapping style and these sort of comparisons to some of the greatest rappers that a lot you know can you talk more about that yeah yeah i think um i think i like kendrick's rapping style because it's uh it's complex and in you know sort of I, I now i'm gonna sound like the old like uh the old hip-hop guy the aging you know backpacker but it when i listen to kendrick stuff it, it totally reminds me of like uh Andre, he, he has some very strong Andre 3000 parallels. He sounds a lot to me like a, his early mixtape stuff sounded like Jay Z. Um, he also has some Lil Wayne in there. Like he, he has this sort of this way of branching new styles and old styles. So he raps like an old head, but his music, thanks to like Soundwave and Terrace Martin and all these people, it has this very big sound that's so popular today. And so when you take somebody who's rapping like Ice Cube and like Andre 3000 and you put it over some trunk rattling beat, it, it touches everybody. It touches everybody. And I think it made me think back to Nas's Illmatic because they're both very visual writers too. And that's, that's the, um, I think that's the greatest compliment that you can give a writer. When somebody walks up to me or to anybody and says like, yo, I can really see everything happening. Like, even in this book, I, I felt like I was in the studio. I felt like I was walking down the block with him. That's the greatest compliment because that means that, you know, you're tapping to tapping into a sort of visual style of writing. And Nas, especially on Illmatic, was like that. You know, every time I listened to Illmatic, and I remember when it came out in 1994, 90, um, I felt like I was on the subway. I felt like I was in Queensbridge Projects. I felt like I was 
you know, walking with him through all of this stuff. And Kendrick is totally that, especially with Good Kid. I think Good Kid more so than any other album of his, you can see it happening. And I also love the complexity of the way he presented that album where it's almost Quentin Tarantino style, right? Where it starts with this dramatic scene and then you don't know what happens at the end of the scene. Then it backs way up to when he was a kid and then it walks you back through that, that scene at the end of the movie or the album, or whatever. So I think that's his greatest asset, man. I think, I think Kendrick as a visual storyteller is what sets him apart from everybody. Even like, you know, and there's some great rappers out here, but I think the visuals for him, like you could take any of his albums and make it into a movie and it'll work just fine. You don't have to change anything. You can just scene for scene, song for song, and it's gonna match up perfectly. I have a question um, about the timing in terms of writing this biography. I mean, he's what, 34, 33? Um, it's, is, it very, is it normal to write a, a biography at that age? I mean, he has a long life ahead of him. And so it's, it's it, it would, you know, is it too early to, to, to try to give this sort of picture? Why do it now? And not, you know, perhaps- That's a fair before. question. <laughs> That's a fair question, and a lot of people have asked me that question. My my answer is really simple, and it may even be cliche. Why wait? I mean, because it, again, especially as black men, as black people in this time, you never know what's going to happen. I'm I've always been of the mindset that we shouldn't be waiting to give people their flowers because because you see that on social media, somebody passes away that maybe you hadn't heard about in like ten years or heard of, heard from in ten years. Oh man, we didn't give them the flowers, and they did this. This, 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 and then everything becomes a tribute. Whereas, you know, why not, why not celebrate the history now? Because it's recent history. Even though it's recent history, it's still very prominent Black history. And yes, you, you totally can wait, and I'm sure somebody else will tap in, and they'll, they'll tap into more things. But there is no denying the, the dramatic history of 2015 and 2016 when all, you know black men were getting killed left and right and we all felt like who knew who could be the next hashtag we all just felt very tight and his music tapped into all of that and i just remember like this moment in time of watching him ascend from section 80 or even overly dedicated to damn and then it ends with the pulitzer like that's crazy to me so i thought it was worth capturing that and also you know, even even as I was finishing the book, you know, look at the people who passed this year, man. You you know, Kobe Bryant in January, Chadwick Boseman, Pop Smoke, like all of these people who they're young and they, you know, they were just going about, they didn't think anything was going to happen. I mean, in the case of like Pop Smoke and uh, Kobe, it was like that, where it was just like, you know, they were just living their lives and the next thing you know, they're gone. And so I've never, I've never wanted to be a person who waited to celebrate people, especially black people, because there's a whole generation of folks who may not know about them. Like if, for instance, my next book is about De La Soul. And there's a whole generation of listeners who haven't heard De La because their stuff is not on streaming, but they're great. So why not tell them that they're great now when they, when they can open it up and see how great they are. So as corny and as cliche as that sounds, uh, that that was my reasoning for doing it right now. I think it was a uh, timing. I mean, I think people who there's no way you can not read this book and not be a Kendrick fan. I'm just being honest with you. It's it read it reads well. Uh, it, it just really pulls you in, real quick, and it's a page turner. Um, and I wanted to stay on the topic that we're on right now in terms of the killings of unarmed black men because you speak a lot about that in chapter five, you pretty much detail the Black Lives Matter movement and you give this sort of line, timeline on um, leading up to basically now, on, you know, how we got here. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, deciding to put, you know, a big chunk of information about, you know, these sort of um, social movements that are going on and like pretty much uprising uh, I think you do a really good job of detailing that. So can you talk a little bit about that? No, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. 
so much. Uh, that was a hard chapter because, I mean, it's 10,000 words of me studying. Like, I had to dip back into some local journalism with that one. I had to, like, study different frames of the Eric Garner tape. I had to listen to the Trayvon audio a bunch. I talked to Tamir Rice's mom. I talked to Mike Brown's dad. Um, that was a hard one. That was hard. But I, the reason why I did it that way, where I was like, no, it just has to be a whole chapter of this, is because, again, and just being like 100% frank, it's like white people are good at trying to forget. Like they're good at they're good at acting like they don't remember. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know it was this way. I didn't know it was that way. And so that was when I decided like, listen, I need to write this in the clearest, frankest language I can. So let it be no mistake that this is what happened. This is why it happened. This is what white, white privilege means. This is what police brutality is. I wanted to lay it out totally. But I also wanted to, I don't know, because I know it's a lot. You know, I, I'm honest with myself. And so I also wanted it to read as such where, okay, you read chapter four. If you're not in the mood for chapter five, you can skip to six and still get the framework of what's going on. You can skip right to, to Pepper Butterfly and still get all the stuff. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to document everything because again, it's history and, um, it's going to be, you know, I've realized that that's going to be on shelves. It's going to be in audiobook form. And so if you're, whether you're reading it or whether you're listening to it, you need to know, like if you weren't around for it, you need to know how it felt. You need to know what it was about. So I wrote that chapter, especially for like, you know, my little nieces and nephews, my godson, who's like three. Well, when he comes, my when he comes of age, he's gonna go back and be like, "Damn, Uncle Marcus, I didn't realize all that was going on." And it's like, "Yep, this is how it happened in this order." That's exactly why I did that. You speak about the opposition that uh, Kendrick Lamar uh, faced during this time, where he was interviewed about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I thought that was really good uh, of mentioning that because you're not just painting this perfect picture of Kendrick, you're really showing all the complexities and the struggles and challenges he's facing as an artist of ha having to get it right every time as though he's, you know, has to say the right things, has to put produce and, you know, and deliver the right kind of music for the people. Um, so can you talk about this opposition? Because he doesn't just face opposition with these remarks. It's also with his music and how it's supposed to be timed. Is it relevant? And it's, you know, he, it's a lot of controversy surrounding who he is as an artist. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I think it's easy to forget now because we all have short memories, but uh, the lead up to September Butterfly was not smooth. Like <laughs> people forget that, you know, that I, and I, and I realize that music journalism is a small bubble, but I do remember when I came out and it was just a straight up Isley Brothers loop, that version, it was like, oh, I don't know about this. This sounds kind of popish, but we all kind of shrugged it off. Like, ah, maybe it was a one-off single. And then King Kunta comes out and it sounds like James Brown. And it was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to fit because all of the singles were so different. And then Black of the Berry, and then that last verse was kind of uh, got back into some respectability politics a little bit. And it's just like, okay you know we there was a palpable fear that like the next album after good kid mad city was going to be on some pop stuff and it wasn't it was going to be like it's commercial like you know to take another Nas reference it was going to be ill matter going into it was written you know what i mean i thought people thought it was going to be that and um you know then like you said he gives the interviews where he talks to, i think it was billboard but he was like oh well what happened to mike brown was terrible before we have to learn to respect ourselves and you know it, it, it sort of rang off like Kendrick had gotten a little bit of money he had gotten some fame uh his album had gone platinum and now all of a sudden he's he's caping for an audience that didn't really look out for us um and like you said man it was important to point point that out as well because none of us are perfect and yeah, he, he gave some really bad interviews leading up to that. And he faced some backlash from like fellow rappers. Lupe was talking trash about him, Zelda Banks and Kid Cudi. They were like, I don't know about this guy. So 
it was important to point that out as well because especially in the case of I, the timing was not good because all of the music was very, very uh, sort of sullen. It was angry. We all were really, really upset about what was going on and we weren't really in the mood to hear something like that. Um, but yeah, no, it was me. I wanted to provide perspective, nothing else, because yes, I, it is a celebratory book, but at the same time, it's not with the, he wasn't without misstep. And it was important to point those, those out in glaring detail as well. I'm going to read um, a synopsis at the beginning of this book. Um, and you write, uh, the 13-time Grammy Award-winning rap artist, rap star is just in his early 30s, but he's already won the Pulitzer Prize for Music, produced and curated the soundtrack of the mega-hit film Black Panther, and been named one of Time's 100 most influential people. But what's even more striking about the Compton-born lyricist and performer is how he's established himself as a formidable adversary of oppression and a force for change through his confessional poetics and his politically charged anthems and his radical performances. Lamar has become a beacon of light for countless people. The butterfly effect is the extraordinary triumph story of a modern lyrical prophet, an American icon who has given hope to the bucking under the weight of systemic racism, reminding everyone through it all, we gonna be all right. Why did you write that? <laughs> uh, a confession, I didn't write all of that. Uh, that, <laughs> that was uh, that was Simon Schuster that ran that past me, but I approved it because, um, you know, even though it's dramatic language and it's, you know, uh, you know, when people, people see the word profit and all that, they bristle, but there is no denying that those moments, especially for him, those moments between like 2012 and 2017, that five-year run, is arguably the greatest it, it's one of the greatest runs in music history of any genre i'm not talking just rap I, I think that the reason why i wanted to 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 approve language that dramatic is that you know when people debate rap albums they say like oh the greatest rap album of all time is is paper butterfly one of the greatest rap projects it, you know so, so on and so forth but honestly i think his music resonates at the same level as like what's going Marvin Gaye's what's going on Stevie Wonder songs in the key of life like all-time great records of any genre and I think it's important for people to finally recognize hip-hop as uh as an important genre in that regard and don't just keep it in a box you know just just celebrate it like you celebrate everything else and so that's what I wanted to do with that book that's what I wanted to do with that passage and uh, hopefully it connects with people because I, I definitely wanted to, you know, just just sort of celebrate brothers while they're here, for real. What are some of the biggest takeaways you want readers to get from the book? I want more than anything else, man. I think I want, you know, sort of, you know, to, to go back to what we were talking about before. I don't want people to wait to celebrate black artistry. I don't want us to hide from stuff that's great. You know, if, if it's great, mm -hmm. if your friends are great, tell them they're great. If, if the music is great, say that too. Um, but I also want people to realize that, uh, you know, Kendrick's a very honest guy and his music is incredibly honest. And as a result of his honesty, on, especially on September Butterfly, it opened the, the, the floodgates for all kinds of music after that, all kinds of like-minded jazz and soul and hip hop and everything. And so the main takeaway I want is, you know, you too can be Kendrick Lamar, you, you know what I mean? Like if you just, he didn't, and I even wrote this in a book, like he, he didn't just, he wasn't born a great writer or rapper. He just worked really hard at his craft and he put his 10,000 hours in. So more than anything, man, I just want people, if you have a dream, if you have something that you want to do, put a 10,000 hours into it and you too can be that guy on the, on, on the cover, for real. Come to the end of this segment. The butterfly effect, how Kendrick Lamar ignited the soul of Black America can be bought and purchased where? 
<laughs> all of the internet, man. Uh, Amazon, uh, definitely support indie bookstores. So, um, you know, every indie bookstore. Um, yeah, man, it, it's pretty easy to find. It's also on like Apple Books, Google Books. So if you want to do the audio, it's on Audible. So all you have to do is type in like the butterfly effect, Kendrick Lamar, and it'll come up everywhere. Thank you for coming on, and I hope to see you soon. All right. Thank you, man.